Good evening. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reform Presbyterian Church as we gather together for our evening message. And tonight we continue in our time in the book of 1 John. And before we get to the preaching, let's get to the praying. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for you have given to us this glorious Sabbath day that we might rest in your glory, that we might receive a foretaste of that blessing which comes in the heavenly places. God, we pray for the power of the Holy Spirit that you will lift us up into your presence. And dear God, that the words to which we hear today might uh, encourage us in the faith, challenge us in our sin, and remind us of the beautiful nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now the words to which I would like to call your attention to tonight come from 1 John, and we're going to continue in chapter 2. And today, we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 14. Again, that's 1 John chapter 2, verse 12 through 14. Let us hear the word of the living and the true God. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven, you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Amen. Now, John is taking a little bit of a breather. He has spent the majority of the first chapter and a half of this letter warning Christians about false teachers. He's been warning them about the Gnostics, you know, those who have a secret knowledge. And he's been warning them about the Judaizers, those who would add to the law of God and would require works under salvation. He has been careful in calling unto them to consider the nature of the gospel, that Jesus Christ is dead for sinners, that Jesus Christ has laid down his life, that sinners might be brought out of death and into the glorious life of the gospel of grace. And so now he writes, <coughs> excuse me, to three kinds of Christians. You know, these titles, little children, fathers, young men, are not describing ones of a physical age, but those of a spiritual age. The Apostle Paul, in a negative way, uses these uh, distinctions to the church of Corinth. You remember there how he chastises them because they've never moved on past the milk of the world. Right? They are still little babes. They have not been able to take on and have been unwilling to take on the meat of the word. And so he encourages them to get off the milk and onto the meat. They might grow not only in their knowledge of Christ, but might grow in their understanding of the gospel that he has proclaimed. Now John, in a similar way, is likewise encouraging each of these different kinds of Christians to remember what it is that has brought them thus far and what is going to encourage them to continue in their Christian faith. So let's take a look at each of these three particular groups. Of course, when we see little children here, you know, we're thinking of those who are new Christians, those who have freshly come to the knowledge of truth. And what does John want them to think about, think upon, and consider? He wants them to focus on the forgiveness of sins. Now, why would that be? Why, why would he specially focus on the forgiveness of sins when it comes to young children? Well, that's where they most easily are led astray, not only by false teaching, but by Satan himself. You know, Satan wants to grab the newly sown seed out of the ground. And the easiest way to do that is to remind them of their unworthiness 
of the gospel. To remind them that they are gross idolaters. To remind them that they have not, in, in kind of a time sense, been that far away from being under the wrath and curse of God. And so John is encouraging these young Christians to remember the basics of the gospel. And that's true for all of these groups, whether they be little children, young men, or fathers. You know, he's wanting them to really go back to the basics. So let's again go back to the basics of the young children. Now, this is something that even mature saints, of course, can learn from. The Apostle Paul is always careful to remind his readers of the nature of himself. You know, in 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to do what? To save sinners. And what does he say about sinners? Of whom I am chief. You know, this humble reliance and remembrance of the inability of ourselves to save ourselves is the answer that we're supposed to give to Satan when he throws our sins in our face. We're to tell Satan, of course I'm a sinner. Of course I've fallen short of the glory of God. Of course I have done these things that have made me unworthy of the grace of God. Because what does the Bible say? My Christ does not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. For whom did Christ die? Christ died for the ungodly. And because Christ has died for the ungodly, because Christ has healed those in need of a physician, we have now been made what? Well, right? We have been made partakers of his work. We have gone from our former manner of life into the new life we have with Christ Jesus. So when Satan throws those sins in your face, you can respond by saying, my trust is not in my works. My trust is not in who I am, because I'm a sinner. My trust, my trust is in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Redeemer. Go and see him, Satan, for he holds me in his account. My righteousness is, is Christ's righteousness. And it's not me who died, but Christ who died. And it's Christ who lives in me. So for these young Christians, John, again, is comforting them with a very basic testimony of the gospel. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. You, for what? For his name's sake. Right? Why are any of us saved? Why are any of us brought into a right relationship with God? And what does the Bible tell us? For the glory of God. That's why we're brought into a right relationship with Him. So that we can worship Him. So that we can praise Him. So we can bring honor unto Him. Right? In, in a very real sense, the gospel is not about us. The gospel is not about you or me. The gospel is about God Almighty. And the beauty of his saving work through his son, Jesus Christ. And through the application of that redemption through the work of the Holy Spirit. Right? This is why the Shorter Catechism tells us in question one that our chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Right? This is, gets to the heart of the second part of the advice to the little children. They are to remember that their sins are forgiven and they are to remember that these sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Right? And you think back to the name of God. right? The name of God is a special name. In fact, we know that it's so special that the Jews kind of created a barrier around the name of God so that they wouldn't even blaspheme. And of course, we see this in the way that the capitalized four-letter word Lord shows up in our Old Testament, right? The name Jehovah. It is the name of God. And what does that signify? Because we go back to uh, the book of Exodus, and when Moses tells, or when God, or let me rephrase that, when Moses asks God what he is to tell the people in Egypt has sent him, right? what's the name that God gives him? I am who I am. And that language, that I am, is all about understanding 
who God is and what God has done. Right? We, we, one of the things we comfort ourselves with is the idea that God is the great I am. Right? He's the great present tense. Right? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is no changing with God. And there's no change in the promise that God has laid upon the hearts of sinners. So if Satan's attacking you and you're a young Christian and you are falling under the weight of Satan's attack, you're to remind yourselves that you're a forgiven sinner, but the ultimate hope that you have is in the name of the Lord your God, right? That is your peace, that's your comfort, that's your bulwark, that's the rock upon which you stand. That the God who called you out of darkness and gave you the light of his gospel is never going to forsake you, forget you, or cast you into outer darkness. If you have truly been saved by the blood of the Lamb, there is nothing that can stain you and take you out of his love. And young Christians especially need to hear this. Again, because not only are their consciences especially uh, uh, um, naturally uh, led towards doubting their place in the kingdom, but they are also easily led astray. And we get a sense of that because of what John says to the young men. Right? I write to young men because you've overcome the wicked one. Right? I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Again, notice what he says there. Right? And when he's writing to the young Christians, right, to the little ones, he obviously wants them to hear what he has to say to the young men. Right? Those who are more mature in Christ. Right? What has enabled them to move from the little child stage to the young men's stage? We see the fruit of that. They've overcome the world. But how has that taken place? You can notice what it says there in verse 14. Because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. Right? Where's their strength coming from? Their strength is coming from the word of God. Right? Young children, right? let's think of it physically here for a second. Right? Young children have to be taught how to read. Right? Young children have to be taught how to learn. Uh, again, that's really what we mean when we say educate someone, right? We're, we're bringing knowledge to them. And we're teaching them how to use that knowledge and how to operate with that knowledge. But where does the young man get his strength? Again, he gets it from the word of God, which abides in him. That's really the message of that passage, for instance, in Colossians 3.16. Why are we to sing the Psalms? So that the word of Christ dwells within us richly. Right? When we sing the songs, we're singing Christ's words, and we are being, again, rich in the very Word of God. Right? And if the Word of God dwells within us, what's there no room for? Right? If, if, if there's no room, if all that's in us is the Word of Christ, there's no room for Satan to attack. Right? There's no way for the world to edge its way in. If you're filled with the Word of God, then it's not going to to allow you, again, to be inundated with wickedness and with the information that Satan is swirling around you. Right? In a very real sense, your brain is full with the Word of God. Okay? This is where the strength of the young men comes from. Right? It doesn't come from the fact that they just happen to be Christians for longer than the little children. Right? Again, this is not a statement of how long these individuals have been in Christ. Again, it's a statement about what they have done with that time that they have been in Christ, right? They have redeemed the time, as the Apostle Paul says. And how they redeemed the time? Again, by allowing the Word of God to dwell within them richly, right? They know the Scriptures. They know the revelation of the Lord our God. And how do you think they got to know the Word of God? Just them sitting down and reading and reading and reading and reading. Right? There's a lot of people out there who read the Bible a lot who don't know any more about God than the pews in the sanctuary. Right? It's not just a head knowledge that we're talking about here. Right? It is a heart understanding of the work of Jesus Christ that's informed, to be sure, by the written word of the living God. 
but it's a word which has been meditated on, a word which is believed, a word which is comprehended. It's a word that the young man has spent feeding upon. Think about that language for a second. Right? What is a young man feeding upon? The word of God. How does he feed upon it? Through the reading of the word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? Through the means of God's grace. One of the things that's interesting about the own life of the Lord Jesus Christ is what does it tell us in the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke, right? That he grew in knowledge, right? And how did Jesus grow in knowledge? He grew in knowledge through his mother and his father taking him to synagogue every Saturday, right? Where the word was read, right? Where the word was exposited in kind of a, in our sense of that, where the word uh, was sung in, in the Psalter, and Jesus learned in that way, right? Well, how are we to learn? Are we to learn any differently than Christ, right? Through the regular taking in of the means of grace, through the preaching of the word, through the reading of the word, especially on the Lord's day. This is one of the things that Paul warns the people in the book of Hebrews about, right? What has caused weakness to come in the flock? Right, the fact that they are forsaking the gathering together with the other people of God on the Lord's day, right? On the Sabbath day in the New Testament, right? This is one of the, the, the blessings of the keeping of the fourth commandment, right? We have six days to labor in our earthly labors to enjoy the uh, entertainments, if you will, of the world. And God has given us one day in seven in the New Testament on Sunday, Right? that we call the Christian Sabbath, where we are given this opportunity, this blessed opportunity to feed on the word of Christ, to put aside all the trials and all of the worries of the secular world and spend that time with Christ. Spend that time with godly fellowship. Because again, this knowledge that the young men are being fed by and finding strength in is a knowledge which they're learning from one another. The, the, the fellowship of the saints is a vital part of this growing from little children to young men. Right? The whole idea of discipleship has within its very title, its very definition, the teaching of the word of God to make mature saints. So again, this, the, this idea that John is laying out here, right? I write to a young man, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. We're also meant to think of another avenue of the word of God, right? What does, uh, in, in kind of older Reformed literature, do we hear about the feeding on Christ, right? It's talking about the Lord's Supper. It's one of the reasons why when the Lord's Supper is offered, Christians need to do everything they can to come into fellowship with Christ. Because right? we believe, again, as Presbyterians, that something happens in the Lord's Supper, right? We feed on Christ and we receive his grace unlike at any other time in the life of the church. Now, again, this doesn't mean that, therefore, we need to eat the Lord's Supper all the time in order to grow in Christ, right? That's not what we understand that to mean, right? We're not Roman Catholics. We don't believe grace is infused through the taking in of the bread and the cup. Right? But this is part of the means that God uses to enrich us with the knowledge of Christ, you know, the word of Christ dwelling within us richly. Right? Taking advantage of these sacraments is part and parcel of growing from a little child to an older child. Right? From a little child to a teenager to a young man, as John lays it out here. Well, the third thing we see laid out here we have little children, we have young men, we also have fathers. Now notice what John has to say to fathers. Again, he's not here talking about males with children. Right? We're talking here again about spiritually mature saints, fathers in the faith. Think about the way the fathers are talked about in the New Testament. Right? When we hear that language, who do we supposed to think about? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? We're meant to think of the patriarchs of the Old Testament. Again, that word patriarch has, has come to have kind of a negative connotation in our day, but there's nothing wrong with that word. 
right? Patriarch is a biblical word, and it's a word which just means that fathers who lead well, fathers who are in charge, fathers who are mediating the word of God to their families and to the ch in, in their own offices in life. So patriarch, again, is not necessarily a bad word, but we see John using father here in a similar way, right? He's talking about those who are mature in the faith. And in a real sense, of course, again, he doesn't mean just men, right? These aren't mature women as well. Just like young men also means young women, right? And again, these aren't, aren't kind of gender-based topics. These are talking about the kind of levels of maturity in the faith. Little children, young men, and fathers. Well, again, let's look here again what it says about fathers. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. Now, there's very little difference, obviously, here between the first and the second time John uses this. Again, notice what it says. You have known him who is from the beginning. Now, what, what in the world is John talking about here? Again, he's talking about those who know God as he is. Right? They have advanced, if you want to use that language, from seeing God, again, as the one who forgives sins, uh, knowing God as, as Father. They've gone from allowing the Word of God to abide in them and give them strength to knowing God in a fullness, right, in a greater way in this. And this is, again, a testimony of the maturity of their faith. It's another way of thinking about the nature of our own call to grow in Christ. And where do we see evidences and witnesses of this in the New Testament? Those who have gone from little children to young men to fathers in the faith. Well, again, let's look at some of these men. Well, think about someone like Stephen. Right? Stephen had gone from a young child to being a young man called to be you know, a deacon in, in the church, somebody who was given authority within the church, to then he is an evangelist preaching the good news of Christ. And what do we see at the end of Stephen's life? Right, We see a man who is being stoned to death, and what is his reaction to those things that are happening around him? To continue to proclaim the gospel. Right? His immediate earthly situation has no bearing on his attitude and on his actions. His desire is that others might know Christ as Savior. Now that doesn't mean, again, that becoming a father means becoming a preacher. Right? We know that, that that office is restricted in the New Testament to qualified men. But that doesn't mean, again, that women can't be fathers in what John is talking about here. You think of the witness that we see in 1 Timothy of the mature women. We see this in 2 Timothy as well. You know, what is said of Lois and Eunice in 2 Timothy? Right, That they are to be commended because they brought young Timothy up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Right, The fathers, the male figure in the households, had failed miserably. But Lois and Eunice had taken it upon themselves as responsible <clears throat> for the welfare of Timothy to teach him of Christ. And the mature witness of the faith is also seen in 1 Timothy where the older women, right, the mature women of the faith, take the younger women under their wing and teach them of Christ. Right? They teach them how to be godly wives, how to be godly mothers. And so this witness here, again, is not a gendered thing. It's a testimony of the maturity of faith, of the way that one, I don't want to say arrives, but comes to the point in their walk with Christ where they have given over all pretenses of their own identity and have given it over to Christ himself. Right? They're no longer themselves, no longer seeking selfish. Uh, uh, ideas or selfish means or, or, or selfish things. They have given themselves over so to Christ that there's, as far as the eyes see, little difference. And this is the kind of thing that John is getting to here. There should be an aspiration in the Christian life to go from being a little child to a young man to a father. And we see laid out for us here the kind of plan of growing 
in this maturity, right? You come to Christ, you are forgiven of your sins, and you trust in the name of the living and the true God. And if you trust in the name of the living and true God, what are you going to do, right? You're going to feed on his word. And as you feed upon his word, and as you grow in your strength, as you grow in uh, your ability to know the things of God and to see the world around you through the eyes of faith, right? you mature, you grow to being a father in the faith. Now, is there any sense here where you reach a point in the Christian life where you no longer are a sinner? Well, of course, so. you know, one of my uh, favorite illustrations in regards to this is there was a, uh, a professor at Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia by the name of John Murray. And a young uh, woman came up to him one time and uh, told him how jealous uh, she was of his faith, that she wished that she could be as close to God as he was, as holy as he was. And, and John Murray uh, was kind of a little dour Scotsman, but he looked back at the woman and said, Man, if you only knew my heart. Of course, what he meant there was is that his heart was as full of sin and wickedness as hers, as any other Christian. There was nothing about John Murray that made him somewhat of a special person in regards to holiness, to righteousness, and to sin. You know, really, what made it different was that John Murray fed on the word of Christ. Right? He humbled himself before his Savior, humbled himself before the living and the true God, understood that his sins were forgiven in Christ because of the namesake, because of who God is. And as he grew in his knowledge of these things, right, he grew in the appearance of Christ. Right? He grew in Christ's likeness. Now, he never received glorification on this side of the grave. Right? That comes for all of us on the other side of the grave when we are judged righteous by the Heavenly Father because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And even then, what do the scriptures tell us we're going to be doing in heaven? Right? We're going to continue to grow in our knowledge of Christ, continue to grow in our understanding of him whom we have known from the beginning. This is part and parcel of growing in your understanding of Christ, seeing that there is more and more to know. One of the easiest ways to tell an immature Christian is by their arrogance, is by the way that they have allowed their so-called head knowledge to be lorded over others. And unfortunately, we see this a lot in the Reformed faith. We see men, especially, who come to a knowledge of, of Christ and read every Reformed book known to man. And then, especially, they get on the Internet and they act like fools. That's because they don't know Christ. They might know all about him, and they might know his theology, and they might know what the Bible says, but they don't know Christ. And, and, and that's the young the little children here especially need to be careful with that head knowledge, right? Because Satan will use that to destroy them. And what's the easiest way that John gives us to protect ourselves from arrogance, from pride, and from all of these things? It's again to turn back to the very basics of the gospel. Little children, because your sins are forgiven, you for his name's sake. As long as we remember the very basics of the gospel, that we are sinners in need of a Savior, that there is no hope for us outside of Christ, as we are grounded in the faith, as we're grounded in the word of Christ, which on every page reminds us that we're sinners and reminds us of how great Christ is, then we will grow not only in our humility, but in our amazement that Christ would save someone like me. But there's nothing good within me. I'm speaking personally, I'm a gross, idolatrous sinner. Now, I fall far short of the glory of God. If you knew what was going on in my brain half the time, you would run away. Because I am a sinner. 
And as Paul says, this is a faithful saying we're all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came in the world to do what? To save sinners. And if I'm a sinner, that means Christ came to die for me. And if Christ came to die for me, what has happened to me? I am no longer the man I used to be. Right? I'm no longer that old man. I'm no longer that man who dwells in sin, who dwells in the tents of unrighteousness, who dwells in wickedness. I have been transformed by the power of the gospel. I've been turned from one who was in bondage to slavery to one who is in liberty in Jesus Christ. And this is the start of this walk of faith, of maturing in our understanding, not only of ourselves, but in maturing in our understanding of our place in God's kingdom. We are mature because the word of God abides in us. We are mature because we have known him who is from the beginning. We are mature because our sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. And it's imperative for the believer to remember these things. Because if we don't, then Satan will pluck us out. And of course, in the reality, Satan won't have a very hard job to do. Because we'll go with him hand in hand and show ourselves to be like Alexander the coppersmith, who have loved this present evil world. That's why this overcoming of the evil world plays such an important role. Uh, role in what John has to say. Right? We don't overcome the world by the works of the flesh. We overcome the world by what? By the word of God abiding in us. Through the knowledge of our salvation in Jesus Christ. Through our knowledge of who God is from the beginning. So brothers and sisters, as we close our time uh, in this passage tonight, let's think about not just where we are on this scale. Right? That's not really what this is about. It's not about uh, kind of judging where we are in the walk. It's about asking the question, though, about where we should be on that walk. Do we have the Word of God dwelling within us richly? Right? Are we taking advantage to feed upon Christ, especially on this day that He has made? Right? Are we wasting our time with frivolous things on the Lord's day? Are we spending time in the Word? In growing in faith, growing in understanding, growing in especially in understanding of ourselves. That we are sinners in need of a great Savior. And that we are weak vessels who cannot bear these things on our own. But we are strong in Christ, who is our rock, our redeemer. And in his house we dwell. And let this be the testimony of our hearts. And let us be, again, not interesting, not, not overly interested in comparing ourselves with other Christians, but we're comparing ourselves with what the Word of God says. Let us grow in His Word. Let's grow in our understanding of the Gospel. Let us grow in our love for the one whom we have known from the beginning. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the time that you've given to us in the Word of God. And God, we pray that you will grow us in grace, grow us in understanding, grow us in our love for your word and our love for you and our love for the gospel, our love for salvation itself. You have taken uh, sinners, washed them in the blood of your son, and have called them unto your home as your sons and daughters by adoption. May we be blessed in these things in Christ's name. Amen.